Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 36th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendetson Epic International Symposium, China and the World. My name is Sophie Lasko. I am a first year student at Tufts and I'm studying international relations. I'll be moderating today's panel on rule of law, Chinese nationalism and human rights. On behalf of the Institute for Global Leadership, I would like to welcome the delegations of students from Argentina, Brazil, Canada, China, Ireland, Israel, Kenya, Russia, and Singapore, as well as from the US Air Force, Naval, and Military Academies. Before I begin, I want to explain how the panel will run. For the purposes of encouraging as much discussion as possible, each panelist has been asked to give opening remarks of five minutes, and then we will open the panel to discussion among our speakers, and then open it to the audience for questions and answers. Feel free to type your questions as they come in the Q&A function. To begin, as China's influence on the world and liberal world order increases, the international community has expressed growing concerns for China's domestic policies regarding human rights. In the Xinjiang region of Western China, China has been criticized for the detention of Uyghur Muslims in what is claimed to be vocational camps and what others have called as re and what others have called as re-education camps aimed at eliminating Uyghur culture. Tibet, another minority region in China, was recently ranked by Freedom House as the least free region of the world next to Syria. The complicated relationship between Tibetan semi-autonomous governance and the Chinese Communist Party, coupled with increasingly restrictive regulations on religious expression for Tibetan Buddhists, has begged many questions regarding the future of human rights and religious rights in China. In Hong Kong, encroaching Chinese laws that restrict the one nation, two systems policy have sparked civil unrest and mass protest movements led particularly by the student youth. In democratically leaning Taiwan, the Chinese government approach to sovereignty and rule of law has pushed citizens to question the stability of their rights. Growing nationalist sentiment in China encourages us to question what is the Chinese identity and how have domestic policies shaped this identity. This panel will examine domestic policies regarding Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, and their implications on human rights, including LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights, religious rights, and more. We have a distinguished group of panelists today. Joining us are Ms. Ladan Tetong, Ms. Mar Ms. Maggie Lewis, and Ms. Yachu Wang. I will give a brief introduction about some of the work they have done in the context of our panel, and in the chat, you will find the link to the symposium program with their full bios. Our first panelist is, Mad is Ms. Ladin Tatong. Ladin Tatong is the director of the Tibet Action Institute, where she is one of the leading activists for nonviolent movement for Tibet's freedom. Welcome, Ms. Tatong. Great. So before I begin, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I believe I was a last minute addition to the panel or in place of uh, another Tibetan um, uh, human rights advocate. And so I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, I Before I begin, I just wanted to make a couple of notes about geography, population and place names as they relate to my remarks. I'll speak of Tibet as I know it, as a Tibetan. Um, that is an area of roughly 1.2 million square kilometers encompassing the entire Tibetan plateau with a population of at least 6.3 million, probably more like uh, 7 million today, Tibetans over three historical provinces of Utsang, Amdo, and Kham. Uh, and as many of you will know, the Chinese government speaks only of 3 million roughly Tibetans in Tibet. This is because they're counting Tibet only as the Tibetan Autonomous Region or what we call the TAR. Uh, this is the central Tibetan region they split from other historical Tibetan areas um, and the majority of the Tibetan population uh, actually lives outside of the TAR in what China designates as Tibetan Autonomous Prefectures in Qinghai, Gansu, Sichuan and Yunnan provinces. I'll also speak about the Uyghur people and their homeland of East Turkestan, which is uh, what they call their homeland and which China refers to as Xinjiang. So as you mentioned last month, Freedom House's annual Freedom in the World Report, one of the most widely respected rankings on the state of civil and political, political liberties in the world ranked Tibet as 
the number one least free place on earth, tied with Syria and even less free than North Korea. For the past several years, Tibet has held steady in the number two position, uh, before that the number three position, but now here we are. Most people wouldn't know things are so bad because Tibet isn't in the news much these days, certainly not like it used to be. Political leaders, journalists, academics, people who have been concerned about the China-Tibet conflict over many years and have taken action to help Tibetans in the past are unclear about what exactly is going on there. I'm asked this all of the time. What is happening in Tibet? We don't hear much about it these days. Is the situation as bad there as it is in East Turkestan? This is all by design. China has locked Tibet down to the point that it's become a black hole for information. The vast majority of Tibetans can't get out, the international community can't get in, and sending out information by phone or on WeChat is often more dangerous and carries a stiffer prison sentence than engaging in protest. And where thousands of Tibetans once escaped each year on foot over the Himalayan mountains into Nepal and then to India, now only a trickle might make it through the increased Chinese patrols, even on the highest windswept passes and because of the use of high-tech surveillance methods, including drones and facial recognition technology. Up until 2008, an average of 2,200 Tibetans escaped per year. I think in 2019, the number is 18 were recorded as having made it. This most recent clampdown started after the March 2008 uprising in Tibet, when waves of protests swept across all of historical Tibet and challenged the Chinese government at the moment it mattered most in the lead up to the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, when the authorities wanted to ensure there was no sign of instability or dissent. At that moment, we saw a new generation of Tibetans raised entirely within the Chinese system with no memory of an independent Tibet, risk everything to come into the streets and demand their freedom and an end to Chinese rule and to call for the return of the Dalai Lama. They appeared to be fearless and it rattled Chinese leaders and the nation to its core. This was one of the most open displays of defiance in years, and it was playing out in a new age of the internet, with video and images coming out of Tibet, even from the most remote corners of the plateau and in real time. The on the ground security response to that was breathtaking in its scale and in its scope. Thousands of Tibetans were disappeared, detained, tortured and imprisoned. More military moved in and stayed, People who had nothing to do with the protests were punished. But even still, Tibetans resisted with very little space to do so. Since uh, 2009, at least 155 Tibetans have lit their bodies on fire in desperate self-immolation protests. These people come from every walk of life. They were nomads, students, farmers, teachers, monks, nuns, mothers, fathers, and even children. And then there was Chen Chuangguo, party secretary for the Tibetan Autonomous Region. He came in 2011 and he took the repression to a whole new level. His Orwellian grid system of social management saw 700 convenience police stations placed at 500 meter intervals from each other, 12,000 new recruits for police related activity, households made to spy on each other in the double linked household management system. And in 2012, Chen oversaw the mass detention of Tibetans, mostly retired and elderly people, returning from His Holiness the Dalai Lama's Buddhist teachings in India. In an unprecedented, unprecedented move at that time, these people were held for months at hotels, schools, military training centers, and bases. They were interrogated, ordered to the, denounce the Dalai Lama, and forced to attend patriotic re-education classes. Many became ill from the stress of the experience. Some never recovered. Others died when they were released. And then in 2016, Chen Chuangguo moved to East Turkestan. And the system of surveillance and repression, it took him five years to roll, it, roll out in Tibet. Now tried and tested, took only two there. And he escalated so dramatically that the world is now finally recognizing the atrocities being carried out under his watch as genocide. And sadly, back in Tibet today, the repression continues and the Chinese government's assault on Tibetans has reached a breaking point. In an effort to wipe out Tibetan resistance, or as President Xi Jinping calls it, safeguard national unity and strengthen ethnic solidarity, 
Chinese authorities are targeting the three foundational pillars of Tibetan identity, religion, language, and the nomadic way of life for elimination. And this elimination project is being carried out in every space, in the monasteries, in the workplace, in primary and nursery schools, on the grasslands, in towns, neighborhoods, and private homes. Chinese authorities have forced and coerced millions of nomads off the grasslands and into reservation style housing projects, often in the middle of nowhere with little access to jobs or services and so no future for the young people. And the monasteries and the nunneries are being slowly strangled with rules and regulations that push monks and nuns out, block new and younger ones from joining. And for those that remain, there is little time for religious studies and Buddhist practice because they're forced to spend endless hours studying up on the latest propaganda from Beijing. The current Chinese Communist Party secretary in the TAR, Yu Wenjie, has stated that the Dalai Lama must be removed from religion his stated objective as of a recent high level meeting on Tibet is to break lineages, break connections and break origins. Anyone who knows Tibetan Buddhism knows this means it's destruction. And perhaps one of the most disturbing and alarming abuses happening in Tibet as part of this final assault on Tibetanness is the attack on Tibetans mother tongue and therefore the attack on Tibetans, Tibet's children. China's ongoing campaign to eradicate Tibetan language has two major components, changing the medium of instruction in all Tibetan schools from Tibetan to Chinese under the guise of a push for bilingual education and removing Tibetan children from their home communities by forcing or coercing the parents to send them away to boarding schools or what we are calling residential schools. One Tibetan researcher estimates 80% of all children in all of historical Tibet are now in residential schools. This means 900,000, an estimate of 900,000 Tibetan children, uh, in some cases as young as three, having essentially been taken away from their parents by the state and put in residential schools where they're forced to speak and study in Chinese and face political indoctrination and even physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their captors. Residential schools have long been used as a colonial tool to assimilate children, and these practices are now widely discredited and actually looked on as abhorrent, such as the residential schools now, uh, such as those uh, residential schools meant to assimilate Indigenous peoples and First Nations in Canada and Australia. Tibetans in Tibet have expressed widespread concern about the increased crackdown on Tibetan language rights and the resulting loss of fluency and the disconnection of the younger generations from their parents and grandparents. A decade ago, when the Chinese government enacted plans to wipe out Tibetan language education in schools, a wave of massive protests took place. Thousands of students and teachers marched in the streets of Eastern Tibet, shouting slogans like, we want freedom for Tibetan language. These brave students faced down armed security forces while their supporters sent letters and petitions to the Chinese authorities in an effort to protect Tibetan culture and identity. They were able to halt the policies in some areas at that time, but their hard won victory is now being undone as China forces Tibetans into this model of education, despite the well-known internationally recognized fact that children learn best and will achieve the most when taught in their own language. There are legal protections and laws that uphold Tibetans right to live, work, speak, teach their language. The Chinese Communist Party itself claims to be um, that China is a multi-nation state and the constitution itself includes protections for Tibetans to speak, learn, work in their own language, but many language protection laws have been systematically dismantled, especially over the past two to three years. And at this point, it's clear the Chinese government is hell bent on eliminating Tibetan identity because just being Tibetan, the very existence of this distinct cultural, religious and linguistic identity is a threat to the state because Tibetans are different and their oil loyalty obviously does not lie with the Chinese Communist Party or even with China. But over the past seven decades, we've also witnessed wave after wave of Tibetans resisting China's rule in myriad ways, despite the violence and excruciating suffering they surely know will come when they take these actions. And even when the stakes were highest, are highest and the repression is most severe, like in the lead up to 2000, Beijing 2008, Tibetans still resist. And this is the beautiful truth that is the paradox of repression. 
the more the authorities try to suppress and control people through intimidation, coercion, and violence, the more the people will resist and the stronger their desire for freedom will grow. We've seen this to be true time and time again in Tibet. And even today, in spite of the wave of violence and repression that's come since 2008, Tibetans continue to challenge Chinese rule. Whether promoting traditional livelihoods, defending language and land rights, working to stop destructive resource extraction projects, Tibetans are carving out space wherever they can to advance their struggle for rights and freedom through creative and organized nonviolent action. And as much as Tibet has been a laboratory for repression all these years, it's also been a laboratory for resistance. One where Tibetans I apologize. Are... I apologize for interrupting, but in the interest of having more time for sure. discussion, I would yeah. love to ask you to conclude your remarks shortly. Sure, I can conclude right now, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. So in, uh, uh, Tibetans are constantly testing strat new strategies and tactics of defiance and resistance and in seeking answers and us seeking answers to hold China accountable, I think the international community needs to take its lead from Tibetans, use more creative strategies and work together, um, not let Beijing mute criticism of its human rights record, not that let them derail attention and support on these important issues. And in the end, uh, collective action is what we need. It's time for governments and indeed all of us to do what Tibetans and have Tibetan done have done for many years. New, use new strategies, new tactics, and work together. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, Laden. And our next panelist is Professor Maggie Lewis. Maggie Lewis is a professor of law at Seton Hall Law, law School. Her research focuses on law in China and Taiwan with an emphasis on criminal justice and human rights. She is a co-author of the book, Challenge to China, how Taiwan abolished its version of re-education through labor with Jerome A. Cohen. Welcome, Professor Lewis. Thanks so much. And I'm delighted um, to be at this event. Uh, thanks to Sophie and to the organizers and, and to my co-panelists. And I'm particularly happy because this is a student-focused panel. And I'm always happy to talk to everyone else. I, maybe even my parents got up or, early in Oregon. Uh, but uh, I was thinking back to when I was the age of most of the audience, uh, which was the 1990s. Uh, also, I saw a a Nirvana Nevermind t-shirt go by me on the streets today of, of Taipei. So I'm glad to see the, the 90s are coming back. Uh, but I, I first went to China in a, a very different time. Uh, and that was a time where, uh, I mean, the Tiananmen massacre was not too far in the rear view mirror, but there's a real sense of opening up. And um, of course, the, you know, the the Communist Party was very much in charge. That was not up for um, discussion that there might be any sort of real challenge to that power. Um, but there was uh, the internet coming in, um, pretty vibrant discussions in universities, WTO, and we're in a very, very different stage right now. And I think that makes it almost all the more important that we have people studying China in the United States and hopefully going there soon, not just the restrictions because of COVID, but there's going to be a lot of political challenges. And I, I was gutted when uh, the Fulbright was stopped in, in China and Hong Kong because uh, I really believe in the people to people exchanges. And even if you don't believe in that, um, you know, I've never seen a strategy that says no less about the person you're competing with. Uh, so I hope that um, we'll have more opportunities to get people back there because it is important to have that in-country experience. Uh, so in my few minutes, I want to speak just uh, briefly um, about a few different issues, uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, I'll say something about Taiwan, uh, but I want to start with Alaska because um, that was something, right? I, I hope people have had a chance to see some of the footage of um, the conversation, um, the diplomats having a conversation that was really quite uh, theatrical. And, and the discussions right now are how much were they really trying to send messages to each other when the messages were things they've both heard before, when actually it seems like a lot of that was geared towards domestic audiences. And if you watched uh, Yang Chie the on the Chinese side, um, yes, he was facing Secretary of State Blinken, but he was really speaking for the cameras that were, that were showing that back in China. And that connects 
next to the nationalism, which is in the title of this panel, and that um, we are at a point where uh, China is feeling very strong, and um, and there has been, uh, you know, COVID is pretty much under control, occasional flare-ups, the economy is doing quite well, um, militarily building up, and we're seeing a lot more pushback. Uh, and that is in the human rights um, vein, that there's um, even more bristling and less willingness to listen to outside criticism. Uh, and I, uh, one example of that was just the other day, Michael Spaver, one of the two Canadians who's been held for over 800 days, went on trial. So the two Michaels were taken into custody in December of 2018. I was actually in Beijing at the time, and I remember it quite well because it was it was jarring. Uh, and it was um, very shortly after Meng Wanzhou was taken into custody in Vancouver um, at the request of the Americans for extradition. She is still, of course, in Vancouver and um, restrained to Vancouver and where she lives, but leading um, a quite a free lifestyle within those confines and have, having had multiple court appearances to contest um, her her arrest and um, and the extradition itself. Meanwhile, um, Michael Spaver and Michael Covering have been held basically incommunicado uh, in China with some limited consular visits. Now, when the uh, trial was held in Dandong, uh, no one was allowed into the courthouse, even the Canadian um, officials who were supposed to be allowed in because they were um, uh, there is an actual treaty. They were not allowed in, and I think that shows some of the. Um, confidence and, and even bravado of the Chinese government that um, this is a fortress and we're not going to even let you see this two hour trial proceeding, which is exceedingly fast. We don't have a verdict yet, but it was an indication of where things are. Um, now, speaking of Xinjiang, you know, East Turkestan, uh, the, the scale of human rights abuses that are occurring there and in Tibet are just, um, it, 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 you start to lose the ability to fathom, you know, these million plus people um, being arbitrarily detained. Um, and we have gotten wave of after wave of, of credible stories about uh, sterilizations, uh, forced removal of children, um, you know, a real um, physical abuse. And, and now we're finally, I think, having this conversation about what do we call this? Is it genocide, crimes against humanity? And that's an important legal conversation to have, but I don't want the technical legal conversations of what label do we put on these atrocities to take away from just recognizing how serious, how devastating this is um, to the people who are still um, in there physically, as well as the international community of Uyghurs and other um, ethnic minorities who have family who are there. Um, we've also seen, of course, recently uh, the massive deterioration of civil, civil and political rights in Hong Kong. This has been going on for a, a few years, but the national security law that came in last summer um, was um, a, a clear juncture of saying that there was going to be even less tolerance and having very expansive definitions for crimes like uh, secession, terrorism, collusion with foreign forces. And just in the last couple of weeks, we've started to see um, some of these cases come into the court and the base hearings. And it is not only, of course, devastating for the people who are being charged under these very serious criminal charges, but also uh, the chilling effect that it is sending through Hong Kong. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is supposed to apply in Hong Kong. That's in the Hong Kong laws, um, but um, it's been gutted. Uh, and, and that's extremely worrisome about you know, what is the future of Hong Kong. Uh, and just last, I do want to say something about Taiwan, but I want to be um, clear that I, I generally don't like speaking about Taiwan as a Tibet, comma, Xinjiang, comma, Hong Kong, ta comma, Taiwan, uh, because Taiwan is in a, a different place vis-a-vis -vis Beijing than those other locations. Even though um, you know, autonomous regions, though not really autonomous, or Hong Kong, which is a, a special area, it's got its own um, laws that are supposed to apply under the basic law, but those are recognized generally as part of the People's Republic of China, even if they are supposed to have um, some different laws and setups than um, if I was just in Henan or another province. Now, Taiwan, um, where I am right now, there's nearly 24 million people 
people. It is a full democracy, according to The Economist. In fact, by moving my family back here, we left a flawed democracy in the United States for a full democracy, which is all the more amazing because Taiwan was under martial law until 1987, had its first direct presidential election in 1996, not that long ago. And today, it really is a beacon uh, for democracy and human rights. Um, and it is increasingly under pressure economically from China, so the gray zone tactics, the flights. Um, and, and that is um, something that's very real here. It's palpable. But, um, but most of our lives here are having, you know, there's daily protests. Um, people are constantly criticizing the government and they go home to their families and don't get asked to tea. And so with all the, 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 the terrible news that we get and all the tensions right now and, and strain and human rights abuses, I do want the students to realize that there are points of light and that uh, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't expect uh, China to follow Taiwan's path. It's not where goes Taiwan, so will China. Um, but just to, to recognize that um, we need to um, keep working to improve human rights and that it is a worthwhile fight. Um, and you have losses, but you also have wins. Uh, and, and so with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the panel along to the next, next speaker. Thank you for your remarks, Professor Lewis. And our third and last panelist is Ms. Yachu Wang. Ms. Yachu Wang is a China researcher at the Human Rights Watch, working on issues including internet censorship, freedom of expression, protection of civil society and human rights defenders, and women's rights. Wang was born and grew up in China, and prior to joining the Human Rights Watch, she worked for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Welcome, Ms. Wang. Thank you so, uh, so much for having me. And it's really a pleasure to talk to students. And this is a topic that is related to students. And I really would like to hear your experience. If you're Chinese, your experience with the Chinese internet. And if you're not Chinese, like your in interaction with uh, your fellow Chinese students. And yeah, I would um, look forward to the uh, discussion. So my topic uh, is uh, internet censorship and propaganda and how that has given rise to the online nationalism. Uh, I just wanted to make clear that given the political environment in China, it's very hard to do public opinion survey. So there are debates in terms of whether actually the nationalism in China is rising. So, uh, but my, uh, talk, my talk will be based on what I have observed online because that's what I can do based um, for being in New York. Um, it's unfortunate, I wish I could have been in China, but uh, given the political environment, it's harder to do, do human rights work uh, by physically being in China. So I would uh, include some of my own experience observing the internet, using the internet in China. I graduated from high school in 2005. And if you know anything about the Chinese education system, you do not have free time when you're in high school. So I had a lot of free time after I graduated from high school when I was in college and formal school in class was not important to me. It was all about being on the internet, reading articles and talking to people. And I, I talked to so many people, formed all those friendships with people I never met and I didn't, never, I didn't ne ne ever, ever met, meet them. But there was this, the school system has always been very censored. What do you have, you know, you read, what are you being taught in the school is very uh, like restricted. But at that time, from when I was in college in 2005 until I was graduate, I graduated in 2009, there was just so much stuff going on uh, on the internet. And people are, there were censorship, but the censorship wasn't that bad. So uh, for example, I had no idea the Tiananmen massacre happened. When I was in high school, I accidentally found all the pictures of the blood or the tanks online uh, after I graduated from high school. And then I asked the people online that I had never met, like what happened? And those people had real experiences. So that was part of the atmosphere I was when I was in high school. And that really opened my eyes, um, challenged what I have learned in school. And this, my experience was not unique at all. That was the experience of a lot of young people during that time, they were discussing about liberal democracy and they were talking about government corruption and how 
China, about political system, how China should be governed. There were a lot of criticism of nationalism and the atmosphere, at least the, the you know, the, 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 the forums and the websites I go to are very pro-West. And then a lot of people were talking to, um, I wanted to go to school to, in the West, which, you know, I became part of that movement of going to school in the West. So in 2009, I came to, the, uh, uh, to study in the United States for graduate school. Then when I was in graduate school and the Arab Spring happened and, and, you know, it has nothing to do with China, but a lot of people were saying on the Chinese internet that, you know, we should do the same, we should go into the street to protest. And there was a huge crackdown on the people online talking about that. Just randomly, the people I knew disappeared. They were walking on the street, then they got grabbed by the, the, the police, um, put in the van and disappeared for three months and they got tortured. And those are the people I knew. They, and that was like such a shock and it's like shock to the system. Then in 2012, late 2012, Xi Jinping became the party secretary of uh, the Communist Party, uh, things just got worse. I think it became visibly worse after that. In 2013, the Communist Party had an internal document uh, called a Document 9, which warns its members against uh, several perils, uh, which include the rule of law, the civil society, a free press. And that document set the tone uh, and following that document, there was a period of unrelenting crackdown on the internet, on the media, on civil society. Um, then in 2013, there was also a huge uh, round of crackdown on people on the Chinese um, social media platform, mostly on Weibo and later on WeChat. Basically people who had millions of followers who are very well known, they all got detained or got imprisoned. Um, so that that just continued. On the one hand, it was the censorship that it's harder and harder to post anything on the Chinese internet. If you post, if, even if you successfully post a thing, then it got taken down very quickly. Then on the other hand, it's the physical removal of people who uh, are who are you know espouse like political liberalization espouse liberal democratic ideas so they were either silenced or they are in jail um you know you guys probably know the artist Ai Weiwei he was very well known on the Chinese internet then he got you know disappeared for 80 some days during the Arab Spring then eventually you know after all these rounds of persecution now he 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 He's in exile. He is just an example of numerous such activists. So this is the one side of a story, which is the censorship. So then the other side of the story, which is the propaganda that the Chinese government is also getting better and better of propagating its own messages. Um, you, you know, if you study Chinese internet, you probably know the concept of uh, uh, Umao, which is the online commentators paid by the Chinese government to post comments that are pro-government. Uh, uh, you know, you know I, I feel, you know, after observing the internet all, the year, all these years, it was easier to see what, who are those Umaos earlier because they were so, pro, the, the, the message was very, are easy to detect that you know they are very likely our messages uh, posted by government uh, people. But now I feel it's harder to detect who are the bots, who are the government paid commentators, and who are actually the genuine uh, expression of pro-government sentiment. Because I feel in recent years there is this rise of people who genuinely pro-government. So sometimes, you know, I suspect this person is a, a comment. A, a, this comment is paid by the government because of the line. Then, you, you, then I go to this person's Weibo uh, page. Then I feel, you know, this person is a genuine person who's having a life. So her, uh, you know, her comments could be a genuine pro-government uh, sentiment, and that says, you know, how successful the government has become on this. I mean. As uh, you know, a young person, I would still consider myself young. So um, 
a lot of Chinese people like animations, especially the you know Japanese style animation. I think I, I'm part of the, this, and you know the Chinese government has utilized that part of um, culture, and they have uh, you know their own animation uh, cartoons uh, uh, like uh, to propagate their me uh, messages through that kind of uh, uh, medium that people actually like um, a very well known. Uh, like series called a uh, 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 year hair affair that centers on a rabbit, um, which was became very popular, uh, and it's a very like pro Beijing nationalistic uh, message. Uh, so I think you know this uh, the two sides of the government uh, have been doing very well. One is they are getting better at censorship. On the other hand, they are getting better at the propaganda. So to the you know for me, I grew up experience the worst and worst censorship. I witnessed the censorship of Twitter, of Google, of Facebook. Uh, so I knew how it felt to have a freer internet. Then I knew how to fe uh, feel to have those things taken away from me. But for people who are 10 years younger than me, they having grew up never hearing or using platforms such as Twitter and Google, and they don't have the experience of my experience, which is to have experienced something freer. So they feel actually, you know, they, I think people are aware of the existence of the great fire or the, the censorship, but they feel, you know, I am protected from this false information that is rampant in the United States, which is true. And they feel, you know, the kind of censorship protected them from uh, social instability. Um, and also they feel, you know, this, this war created and conditions that is necessary for the rise of Chinese owned tech giants like, you know, Alibaba, like Tencent. So they don't resist the great fire the way I did. Um, so I think this is quite new and very, uh, you know, sad uh, to me. Um, the last message I want to say is that all that have been said about government censorship, about propaganda, this is only what I observed on the Chinese internet. I do see a rise of online nationalism, but at the same time, I know this is something that is on the surface because oftentimes like people would contact me uh, saying, you know, saying, you know, I am reading what you wrote on human rights and I'm very uh, like sad. I'm, about the situation in Xinjiang, but because I'm mainland Chinese, I'm, I have families in China, so I can't say uh, what I actually say. So, so there are those messages. So there absolutely are, you know, another story going on beneath the uh, surface. Um, so, you know, I would say that I observe the rise of nationalism online, but there are a lot of stuff that uh, I don't know because of the political constraints. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, Ms. Wang. And I would like to thank all of our panelists today for joining us. Um, their opening remarks were incredibly enlightening and I hope informative for the audience as well. And before we engage with questions from the audience, I would like to invite the panelists to pose questions to each other and engage in conversation with one another. I am curious, Yacho, if in the last um, day or two, um, what have you been seeing about how the Alaska meeting is is playing in um, social media in, in China and, and what the response has been? Well, I think first of all, it's like how the government portrayed this meeting. So there are, uh, you know, stories on the side of, so, so basically I think both sides are pretty theory. So, but the government only showed the side of what the Chinese said the Chinese officials said so they eliminated the parts about the uh you know uh Blinken's criticism toward uh on Xinjiang on Hong Kong and stuff so you always get to the one side and then the narrative has always been very controlled by the Chinese government so I think at this point the government is pretty good in terms of uh, having people believe what it, they what the government wants people to believe so I do see you know people were uh were you know in favor of the government's very um, like strong remarks, uh, this kind of very aggressive stance. 
yeah, that's what I have observed on the internet. Like people are happy what the government, uh, what you know, what uh, yeah, just uh, did, uh, what Wang Yi said. Yeah, I guess I, I don't know how many people know that there was this, you know, kind of the clubhouse moment as it's, it's called. So earlier this year, the clubhouse drop in audio app, um, there was, um, it ended up being just like a week or so where it wasn't yet banned in China and there was all these discussions going on. And of course you needed to have an iPhone. And so it wasn't a random sampling of the population of China, um, but there were some, you know, really robust and, and open conversations. And then the app got shut down and you still have people getting in through VPNs. Um, but I felt like, you know, we perhaps latched onto that too much to try to get a sense of what people were, were thinking. Um, but, um, and now it's back to, you know, we're trying to, you know, read uh, very limited and a lot of times information. But I mean, I don't know if you if you found that that time on Clubhouse was helpful or was it basically just what you've been hearing um, louder because people were all tuning in to hear it at once? Well, uh, yeah, I think I agree with you that first of all, it's an iPhone. iPhone is expensive in China. So it represents, you know, it already had filtered a lot of people who are not in that social economic uh, circle. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm surprised because I knew those people exist because they come to me and write me a like, message without saying who they are. And they say, I'm reading what you're saying. So like even Twitter, like a lot of people send me like DM saying, you know, they have, they are anonymous, but they would say that I read what you uh, write and good work. Or a lot of people ask, how are you doing? Like, I, is it okay? Like you're saying this, how is your family doing? So they're very curious about that because they want to gauge whether they can do the same because I'm from, I have, have the same background, like I, my family is in China. And they, you know, they are interested to see somebody who have this background as speaking publicly. So there are a lot of messages. So I always know those people exist. Uh, so I, I don't think, you know, I'm surprised to see that. I mean, if that always gave me hope because there are those messages coming to me. They would just tell me something that they wouldn't say publicly. And I know those people exist. But to what extent, uh, you know, how much, how, you know, the percentage of people, how are they representative, representative of how people real feel? I just don't know. Like this day is very, very hard to know what people really think, um, just give them political constraint. But I, I, the only message I have is that there are a lot of mess, uh, people who think, but they don't speak publicly and you don't see them, but they exist. I'm curious about the this discussion to boycott the Olympic games or you know the controversy that's swirling around the games for good reason right now um, because of the genocide in East Turkestan, because of all of the, the abuses what do, are people what's your sense of people's awareness inside of the controversy and the real risk to the games do you is it the part of I don't conversations think, do you think I, I don't think so I, I I think this is not part of the discussion uh people are you know aware uh or I think the message has been so twisted about Xinjiang like you know mm -hmm. Just the censorship is so bad. Even I knew people who, who have families who are officials in Xinjiang. They were, you know, they complain about the work, but they say they think, you know, it's not it's necessary. So I think it, just the environment is being very twisted, and the boycott of uh, the Olympic is not part of uh, you know a wider discussion. They're just such. Uh, disparity between what's being talked on Twitter and what's being talked on uh, Weibo. Um, yeah, what, what do you think, Maggie? Yeah, no, I, I mean, certainly the, the discussion about the boycott is not making it into much in the news, obviously, within China. And I, I, I think this is a very important question to ask, particularly because I mean, we, we all know what those opening ceremonies and everything are going to look like. It's going to be happy dancing ethnic minorities, and it's going to be a display of, of 
nationalism and it should be a, a display of patriotism, but it's going to be a platform that Xi Jinping can use to put this into the guise of um, we are doing this you know, to make everyone's economic well, well-being better. Um, one of my big concerns is this push, for example, like the right to development and, and saying that this is the supreme human right when anyone who studies international human rights knows that there's an interdependence and an indivisibility of civil and political rights, with economic, social, and cultural rights, and that's getting thrown out the window. Um, so I think the people, other countries really need to figure out um, how they're going to grapple with this, because otherwise it's going to be really, really disturbing to watch all of these international delegations sit through um, a display of um, a lot of these policies put into song and dance. Um, and as far as um, just sort of um, you know, generally um, the, the news, I mean, I, when I was in, I was last in Beijing in December of 2018, I was last in China in the summer of 2019. Um, and of course, it's, you know, now I don't know when I'll be going back. Uh, but there's, you know, there's just not much sympathy for for the Uyghur population or, you know, for a lot of the ethnic minorities. There's a lot of um, a lot of stereotypes. Um, and there is a fear of the, the terrorism narrative, I think, really did take hold. Um, and I had people who I are well educated and, and I had known for a long time. And one of them showed me the phone of the of, of I went I went out and I saw some of these facilities and they're learning new skills. And, and I don't think it was just performative. I think some people have really internalized that as this is not repression, but rather um, that this is um, a way to um, economically advance those regions. But again, it's hard to tell. It's just uh, you know what people are either because they don't want to really grapple with what's really going on, or they or they actually don't understand, or they haven't been exposed to the facts. Um, but regardless, I don't see much or any movement within China to push back on what's occurring um, in, um, in, in, in Xinjiang and, and other Western regions. So Maggie, a question to you. So, you know, you're in Taiwan right now. So what are pe Taiwan people, we're talking about nationalism, whether there's a, um, a surge of Taiwan identity in response to what's going on in China or in response to what's going on in Hong Kong? Like what's your observation? Well, and it's hard to know um, how much of it, it is in response. Okay, so there's no doubt that there is a surge in Taiwanese identity. For now decades, there's been the same questions asked periodically. So from a polling perspective, you know, you can question, well, some people might say, well, what it means to be Taiwanese, then you say it means to be Taiwanese. But they've been asking people here for a long time, do you consider yourself Chinese? Do you consider yourself Taiwanese? Or do you consider yourself both? And, and, and the Taiwanese only identity hit its highest point within the last year. Um, certainly um, what's happened in Hong Kong is part of that because um, when Tsai Ing-wen ran for re-election and, and won by um, you know, several million votes, um, one of her messages was, look at what's happening in Hong Kong. Don't kid yourselves. You know, this one country, two systems is not holding up. And that resonated. Um, but also the absolutely phenomenal response to COVID here, um, that's a point of pride. And, and that's nothing to do um, with China. So I think people are just also very proud in who they are and, and this place that is their home. So I don't want to just have the Taiwanese identity growth be in response to something um, that's outside Taiwan. Um, this is also, um, I mean, for people who have spent time in Taiwan and spent time in China, um, they're so very different. And, um, and I know more about China than most of the people I meet here because I've spent more time there. Um, and, and I think that you're only going to see um, a growing sense of Taiwanese only identity. Um, which you know, of course presents challenges from Beijing's perspective because um, this sort of old, they used to think kind of win the hearts and minds and come over and get a good job in Shanghai and we'll get closer. Um, and that thinking is just, um, it's not sustainable. The more people here really do consider themselves distinct in a way um, that they don't see some kind of unification as in the cards. Thank you all. And in the interest of time, I think it would be appropriate for us to move on to take questions from the audience. Um, and just a reminder that the audience, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A function, and I will be reading them and posing them to the panelists. So for our first question, 
Um, I would like to ask the panelists a question from Brett Zakim, who is a Epic Colloquium member for this year's Epic class. And she asks, how far will the CCP go to suppress people in Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong? It is clear that the CCP does not abide by international standards regarding human rights, but in the interest of garnering soft power and challenging the United States to be the next global hegemon, is there a line that the CCP will not cross for the sake of their reputation? I mean, I think in part that's up to the international community at this point. I do feel like the um, there has to be there have to be real consequences for what's happening in East Turkestan. I mean, just the idea that you could have crimes against humanity or genocide taking place up to you know maybe two, more than two million people in camps. In, in these um, internment camps and have the games going on as a legitimizing force in, in Beijing at the same time, have heads of state coming. I mean, even, you know, Mitt Romney suggested a partial boycott, but just having the games move ahead that, that, that genocide or this level of repression and these atrocities wouldn't be considered a red line. Uh, even for the Olympic games, I just think it, you know, it's the Olympics, okay, it's not the be all end all, there are other things government should do, but at least this should be possible in order to, you know, make a strong statement to the Chinese Communist Party that there, you know, are places you cannot go in terms of repression um, that we know about. So I just, I guess I just feel like it is a bit of an open question because Tibetans have had some protection and people ask me why this isn't happening in Tibet in this way. And I just feel like, you know, there are a bunch of different answers, but one is of course that Tibetans have had, we've had the Dalai Lama, a high profile, you know, public figure and a lot of international attention and support for many years. It hasn't fundamentally changed things on the ground in Tibet, but it has, I think, at least in the modern times, saved us from this kind of, um, uh, horror. But, you know, if, if China gets the green light and the big, you know, stamp of approval with these, this, this, the winter 2022 Olympics, just at that level, what does it, what does it mean? Where do we go next? 2008 was, was a Tibetan moment, but there was certainly no push for international boycott. There was, you know, it was a different time and place with everything we've seen now and a genocide. I just wonder what, what message I think the message Beijing will get will just be, you know, anything's possible. Go for, you know, go. And, 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 I, and I, I say that knowing that of course they, Chinese leadership cares about what the world thinks, which is precisely why we should do something because they're also taking cues from, you know, international leaders about governments, about how much people are willing to stomach and tolerate right now. It makes me think of the classic movie, I hope people have seen The Princess Bride, where there's a character who keeps saying inconceivable, and then what he says is inconceivable happens, and finally someone says to him, I do not think that word means what you think it means, right? And um, and so I feel like in China with um, East Turkestan and other, it's just, I, I remember when it was news when um, a handful of lawyers didn't get their um, licenses renewed, and, and that seems like, wow, that made it to, like, the front page of the New York Times a decade ago, and now we would just kind of blink. and And I worry about that desensitizing, about that you know you just get used to the news. So I it it needs to be international pushback, and it needs to be multilateral. It needs to be done in concert. And this is where I really want to see if Blinken and Sullivan, you know, if the Biden administration can you know very quickly um, bring together their friends and allies and work through the multilateral you know, institutions and and actually bring to bear pressure because yeah Beijing you know the Lee PRC leadership does care to a certain extent at least um, what their reputation is but it's going to take concerted um, really coordinated pushback um, I think to um, to even move the needle. Um, I totally agree. I don't have more to say. I mean, it depends on what, how the world responds to the government's violations. And as a follow-up question to that, 
I think that, you know, this is one of the most pressing questions for this panel um, coming from Daniel Mandel, who is actually an Epic alumni. Um, he asks, what can we do about this? You know, what specific actions can states take? What can the international community do? What role does the international community play in addressing ongoing offenses against human rights? Um, oh, I mean, there have been actions taken, there have been laws passed and there have been um, sanctions against uh, uh, Chinese government officials, Hong Kong government officials, officials who are complicit uh, in this human rights violations. So I think this is a good step. And there are also uh, actions against Chinese big uh, companies who are complicit who are providing Chinese government with the equipment to uh, survey the population in Xinjiang. Then there are also sanctions against companies who are, you know, uh, engage, non Chinese companies um, or, uh, engaged in uh, uh, like doing business with companies uh, who are in Xinjiang who are engaged in forced labor. So those are the um, uh, the actions that have been taken and should be doubled down. Um, and then there are other, you know, uh, things like uh, London was mentioning about the boycotting uh, the uh, the Olympic. Uh, so those are um, ongoing, and uh, we should push um, uh, actions both on the side of, um, you know, concrete things like sanctions, uh, and the only other 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 side, which is to, uh, you know, to send the message that you should not engage with the regime that is doing all those horrible things um, uh, in China. So like boycotting the um, the Olympics, also like sending a message to business uh, that, you know, you're if you're doing business with those companies and with the Chinese government, you should stop doing that. And um, in addition to these, you know, economic levers, which we need to get more creative about how we make them both targeted and, and have more teeth to them. Um, I also think, you know, something that we can do that is real is to make it so the people who are able to leave and um, are, are able to go someplace and be safe to make sure that there are paths to citizenship or at least long term residency, help in getting jobs. And also that are, you know, these are university students that are universities are supporting Tibetan studies and, and, and the Uyghur languages and, and making sure that if we have this diaspora, you know, this diaspora community, that their cultures to the best we can can also have at least some hope of having refuges outside of China. And, and I, I wish we weren't at that point, but that has to be part of the plan. Um, and then as a lawyer, I think uh, we need to also uh, go at this as um, a legal issue. Um, and we need to have the international community taking seriously that it's not just NGOs asking, you know, is this genocide, but make that something that's happening in the UN. Um, I have written a paper that I think that, you know, Beijing signed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1990 has not ratified it and is further away from ratifying it now than it was back you know, a decade ago, um, I think we should tell them to unsign it. You know, you're not serious about this. Take away the legitimacy of this pretense that, oh, well, we're, we're working towards ratification. They're not. They're moving further away. So also don't let the UN be this veneer of legitimacy to human rights practices that um, actually are, are, are sapping the, the force out of some of the most important international human rights. Yeah, and I think they, we need to see new initiatives. You know, that's one of the like multilateral um, initiatives I think are key. Beijing does not want to see our governments coordinating on their strategies for Tibet, um, uh, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia. Uh, they don't want to see a contact group on Tibet that could develop into anything in the future. You know, they, so what, all of that is taken so incredibly seriously by the Chinese government. And there have been um, in recent years, you know, more joint initiatives, embassies in Beijing doing something together or UN, um, you know, missions to the UN releasing a letter together at an important time. But I think this kind of moment calls for governments, you know, publicly and privately coordinating their strategies together and creating new groups or new bodies, you know, formally or informally to, to, to say, we're going to look at how to address these issues together because then, 
uh, you can't, Beijing can't isolate so easily and pick off and, and punish the countries that take action. And it sends them, it telegraphs a very serious message about a new phase in global cooperation on these issues China considers its core issues that no one is allowed to you know, touch or talk about. Thank you. Yeah, and, and as a follow-up question to that from our student Carlos Udisari, who is one of the EPIC students in this year's colloquium, do you believe that the recent addition of China to the United Nations um, Human Rights Council diminishes the legitimacy of the United Nations Human Rights Council? And what are the consequences of this for human rights discourse globally? The Human Rights Council has had problems for a while with um, that a number of the countries that have sat on it are, are, are not the poster children for great human rights practices. And this is one of the challenges of international human rights is there has, um, it's generally trying to get a big tent approach that if we can bring in more players, um, we can socialize states and hopefully improve their human rights practices um, through that process of, of interacting with other um, states and learning about best practices. I think uh, China is really, really putting that theory to the test. Um, and there are scholars that are, are looking at that and saying that, you know, emerging democracies that, that, that could be more true for if it's a country that's saying we want to show we're leaving behind, for example, an authoritarian past and that they might socialize in a way that improves practices. But um, you can also drag down those practices. And again, that's something I worry about that um, you have China saying we have democracy. They just said this in Alaska, but like very different definition of democracy. If you studied Mao and his theory of democracy that we're really representing the people. They just don't vote to show that we are representing them, right? So you worry that these words like democracy and freedom of expression are gonna lose their normative force. Um, and so that means that I, I don't, you know, I think that the US um, has to get back in there and has to um, own, um, I say this as American, own our problems, um, but also needs to push back against this um, both sideism or false equivalence. It's yes, there are huge human rights abuses in the US. Um, I teach criminal justice. I, I teach about you know the systemic racism, but we don't have to, there is a difference between that and crimes against humanity and genocide, right? And so I think this finger pointing and saying we all have problems, all states have their issues to deal with is China's way sometimes of excusing away um, atrocities. All right, moving on to the next question from Atre Bargava, also an EPIC student. Is there a direct relationship between the nationalization efforts of the Chinese state and the desire to accommodate all parts of the Chinese population to a certain degree of Chineseness? And is this responsible for Chinese actions against ethnic minorities? Moreover, is Xi Jinping's push to nationalism the causal link that is responsible for cultural genocide in China today? And how have these relationships of accommodations been in the past history between Chinese dynasties and peripheral regions? Oh, yeah, I would just say that the, you know, if you look at Tibetan history um, for the past seven decades, at least, um, you know, we see more or less this, you know, there, there have, there has been a uh, level of lip service paid to the idea that Tibetans, other so-called ethnic minorities of China have the right to, you know, practice their culture, speak their language, be distinct nationalities. Um, that has been, you know, sometimes just on paper in policy and practice, it's, you know, it's gone up and down through the years. There have been periods of more or less freedom. Um, certainly the language laws I was speaking of earlier, uh, a lot of those were actually regionally sort of pushed by Tibetans in, in, in the system to try to work region by region to pro find, make protections um, for this teaching, speaking of Tibetan language uh, in, in the school system. But yeah, under Xi Jinping now, there's no, it's just, it's all changed. I mean, as bad as it's been, it's that much worse and to the point where there was language recently, I think it's draft legislative language from January that's talking about just doing away with the whole 
idea of separate nationalities, rights to language, you know, to, to speak, to teach language, that it would almost be criminalized seems to be what the, the draft language was saying, which is crazy um, and has to be pushed back on. And, but, you know, I think this, this they've identified, you know, it's clear Xi Jinping has identified or is, is clear about the problems and not identifying as Chinese as a problem being something else first doesn't work. And that's why, you know, it's not just Tibetans, it's, uh, as we know, it's Uyghurs, it's Southern Mongolians. I mean, we're all, you, we're all targeted. These communities now are all targeted for, for, you know, I, I hate the word assimilation because it just is so, sounds kind of like something that might happen here, but this is nothing like that. You know, we're not talking about, we're talking about a very, um, repressive course of forced um, uh, elimination of identity. And yeah, so I don't, everything is changed under Xi Jinping. It's also not that, you know, it's for Tibetans and Uyghurs, like the Uyghurs will be the, we, we work a lot in solidarity with different Uyghur groups and they'll be the first to say, I mean, just if the camps get closed and if this moment, you know, is made better, of course, that's like critical, but Uyghurs have been suffering persecution and their national identity has been under attack for decades. This is not new. It's just gone to a whole new level. And, and if people are interested in the history of Xinjiang, East Turkestan and, and China and the idea of China more generally, I, I highly recommend just read anything by Jim Millward. Um, James Millward, he's a historian and he is um, does a great job. He also writes a lot of shorter pieces, op-eds, but um, he is a historian at heart and, um, and I think would give you some really good context to look at some of his work. Um, just want to add on that, um, you know, when I was in China as a college student, there was a lot of like uh, learning about the West, learning from the West. I mean, study English is a huge thing. Everybody is studying English. But now recently I observed the reinforcement of the Han and Chinese identity. Like a very good example is somebody here living in the United States, Chinese students, email the Chinese embassy about going back to China during the coronavirus. Then the, uh, the embassy, I think the consulate, the New York consulate emailed her back saying that, uh, berated her for sending the email in English, saying, if you want to have my answer, then send me the email again in Chinese. So like, you know, speak less English and uh, in, in, within the Chinese, uh, education system, there's the emphasis of learning English. So just, you know, one side is the repression of minority identities and cultures and language. The other side is reinforce of the Chinese Han identity among the Chinese population. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and speaking of the coronavirus pandemic, which of course is very timely, um, it has seriously limited the ability of various social movements to mobilize around the world. And one of the questions from our audience members is to what extent do you believe it is responsible for hampering popular movements in China, notably in Hong Kong? And when the pandemic ends, do you believe that there is a chance for reorganization of these movements? I, I'm not a Hong Kong specialist, but I don't think that the coronavirus is really what's hampering. It's it's the government cracking down and 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 arresting key people and uh, you know people who are law professors and these are not and and really just expansive definitions of crimes about you know what is foreign collusion and and what is subversion. So um, and I. I don't think that when uh, the coronavirus is really brought under control and, and it's you know much better in Hong Kong than certainly in the US, um, that that's going to let um, flourish social movements. Uh, the, the PRC party state is very good at stamping out social movements. I mean, it, is, it has really learned a lot of lessons. I was in Beijing when the Falun Gong sit-in occurred in um, the late 90s outside of Zhongnanhai, outside of where the leadership compound is. And they were really caught off guard. 
Um, and you know, suddenly it was everyone from like college students to grandma sitting outside on the pavement. And, um, and, and unfortunately, I think the, the, the party state learned a lot from that and um, has gotten much better at stamping out movements um, when they're small. Uh, so I, I, I hope that maybe there'll be some space and, and vibrancy um, after coronavirus, but I certainly, I don't, I don't, I'm not optimistic that that's gonna move, you know, make, real, make really a difference. I mean, within China, I think the Chinese population generally are proud of how China has handled the coronavirus, except that the regions that were on the uh, lockdowns. Those people are really suffered from the draconian measures, uh, first in Wuhan, then in uh, several other parts of uh, China. But I think the vast majority of people who are, I mean, the people who suffer those terrible lockdowns are still you know, a small percentage. So other people are happy with the government's uh, response. So they're less, you know, they're pretty content. So I don't think, you know, after the coronavirus, first of all, China is, it controls so well that, I mean, people are basically largely live, live a normal life. It's hard for me to understand in the United States. Like, you know, I've, for a year, I've been in this apartment forever. So, so I don't think, you know, this would actually, uh, the effect would be opposite that people are happier with the government's uh, res um, response. and. And then they're, you know, are more proud of that. As our final question um, from Leah Westgard, who is another Epic student, um, he says he's curious to hear about what the panelists think about what dictates news coverage in the United States, and specifically what explains the lack of human rights, the lack of coverage for human rights abuses, particularly those in Tibet as um, we have seen expanding press coverage on issues in East Turkestan, Xinjiang. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's so uh, clear to me that the, you know, we went through this incredible time this around 2008 and beyond where Tibet was suddenly connected to the world in a way like never before. I mean, we can't, you know, the, the, geography just you know obviously cuts the people off and then um the the repression is the next piece but the every tibetan having a cell phone nomadic people you know all the monks if and in some cases you know a whole family sharing a cell phone that just changed everything and the the information just it still flows it doesn't flow like it used to and uh, the consequences have been so incredibly harsh for people who pass information. Um, a 19 year old Tibetan monk was just beaten essentially to death. He died when they released him from prison. He was, he was guilty of going into the streets and calling for um, a free Tibet, an independent Tibet, and I think the long life of the Dalai Lama. And uh, in that case, there were four young monks involved in that protest and um, he, the, the, the one monk who passed the information but didn't in, get involved in the protest, uh, he got the longest sentence in terms of years. Um, so the media doesn't have what it needs. They want pictures, they want video, they want, you know, I, I mean, they, they, people wanna see in this age, day and age, people wanna see what is happening in a place. They don't wanna hear it really from someone else. It just doesn't doesn't have the same impact. And at the same time, and I think we have to be clear about this too, there are a lot of Tibetans who live in the free world in countries you know, where they have rights and freedom, but if their families are back home in Tibet and this um, has really become bad in recent years, they are really reticent these days to, to pass information that they're hearing or to put people, journalists or anyone in touch with people inside Tibet because the consequences are so bad. And so we've seen this very um, effective clamping down on uh, Tibetans in, in exile, uh, like even in New York City, uh, you know, where you would think that people feel far away from uh, the repression of the Chinese state, not at all. And in fact, there another level to this is the, I don't know if anybody saw this story about a New York police department officer who was actually spying in coordination with the Chinese consulate in New York on Tibetans in 
uh, the Tibetan community in, in New York. And so he was in, you know, he was Tibetan, at least most people believe he's Tibetan and he was invited into the community center. He was a part of meetings, he was everywhere. And then next thing we knew he was uh, charged as a, as a spy for the Chinese government. And that also sends a massive chilling effect uh, has a massive chilling effect on on Tibetans who might otherwise be passing information, coordinating, talking to journalists, talking to human rights researchers, you name it. I, I really have to commend the international media. I mean, they did so much to try to to try to get information about what's happening within China. They continue to do so, but of course, a number of them have been kicked out. Um, it's, I enjoy having them here in Taiwan with me, but I, I wish we didn't have so many journalists here. It's because they can't be in China. Um, there's still some really you know, great international media working within China, just thinking off the top of my head, like Emily Fung for NPR, Alice Su for the LA Times, Sophia Yen, who basically walked, um, she works for the Telegraph, walked I don't know how many miles on foot when the taxi driver wouldn't take them any closer to where they wanted to go in Xinjiang. Um, but we, um, if you look at the Foreign Correspondents Club of China, they recently put out their annual report and it talks about um, the increase in harassment of journalists. And, and that's for the foreign journalists who at least have um, their names out there and some protection. Um, they rely, of course, heavily on their, their local um, staff and local researchers who are even more exposed. And, um, and this is really, really worrisome that it is increasingly becoming a black box. Um, and we have a harder and harder time getting information and, and oftentimes is, is now coming at personal costs um, to people that are that are really severe. And just that, that I guess what I would say too, sorry, I, I, should, I didn't even go there because of course that for Tibet has been the reality for so long. So what I would say about the Tibetan situation and then we see in East Turkestan and now we're looking at China and Hong Kong. I mean, the 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 Chinese government has been testing and pushing and testing the limits of the international community's willingness to tolerate and still engage with China in this way, nor a normal way for a long time. And, and Tibet has been a pretty much a no-go zone for journalists for you know, at least the last decade and more. But what is amazing to me is to see that happening in Beijing, like, like Maggie was just saying, to see the hollowing out of the international press corps um, that used to be, you know, reliably in Beijing and able to go run and risk, risk for sure, but run and get somewhere and tell a story. And with that, um, this will conclude all of our discussion. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for such an enlightening discussion this morning. And on behalf of the Institute for Global Leadership, the 2021 Epic Colloquium, and all of our audience members, I truly appreciate you sharing your time, experience, and insights with us. And our next panel will begin at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in approximately 10 to 15 minutes. The panel is covering Buckling the Belt, Environment Development and the Belt and Road Initiative, analyzing the Belt and Road Initiative and environmental implications. Information on this panel is in the chat and we look forward to seeing you at 10.30. Thanks.